good evening everyone this evening we are going to have a vocal exercise workshop or voice culture workshop on behalf of swarasankula sangeeta sabha i heartily welcome all of you to this program to conduct this program we have with us sofia boss sofia boss from chicago sofia boss is a film and concert composer and conductor she graduated from berlin college in 2020 with ba in ethnomusicology in 2017 boss was hired to compose soundtrack to a graduate thesis from chapman university dodge college of film and media arts she has many more creative works to her credit she has plans to attend royal college of music london to pursue two year master in composition for screen she has awarded a fulbright research scholarship to study karnataka and hindustani music in karnataka under the combined guidance of dr ms manjunath and pandit udaya raj karpur in tabla her research includes study of raga and thala systems in karnataka music and hindustani music she currently studies hindustani vocal from shrimati shrimati devi and tabla with pandit udaya raj karpur sofia boss aspires to establish a career in international scope as a film and concert composer performer and educator with an ethno musicology background that informs her creative work she believes that having a wide knowledge across the cultures is the key to developing her artistic sensibility which in turn will enable her to compose for any story in any text any context and to reflect the sonic wealth of the world in in her music she is also getting guidance in theory of hindustani music from mm-hmm. pandit indu dharan rodi mm-hmm. so i heartily welcome sofia boss for this program and i request her to start thank you Thank you Dr. Baskar. I also would like to say thank you to Pandit Veerabhadraya, Pandit Nirodi and Dr. Baskar for organizing this two-day workshop. And I would also like to say thank you to Kemp's Learning Center, Center for Learning for hosting this two-day workshop. I am very honored and pleased to be with you all tonight. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking on the topic of voice culture, which Pandit Nirodi informed me is not much discussed within the classical practices within Hindustani vocal and even Carnatic vocal music as well. So to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is voice culture why it's important, what are its benefits, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about what is voice. What is considered voice, voice quality, and then I'm going to move on to outlining the physiology of our vocal makeup. And then I'm going to move into some exercises that we can all do together this evening. So to begin, what is voice culture? Voice culture is a branch of knowledge that deals with the techniques. It's systematized techniques that aid in right voice production. So essentially, 
you can think of voice culture as an art. It's a scientific art in which the voice is trained to come under the full control of both the mind and the body to produce the ideal singing voice. So how does this differ from general singing practice? You know, when we sing, and even in my early singing education, I thought that singing only resided in just the vocal mechanism, the throat, the practicing of scales and swada patterns. But what voice culture, what voice culture focuses on, it's a more holistic approach to singing, one that involves both the mind and the body. And voice culture, it's a broad, it's a broad field of study, and it covers many topics, including physiology, essentially meaning the physical, biological makeup of each human being. It's also very scientific. It deals with the study of physics, the, the science of sound production and sound frequency. It also covers topics of breath control, Breath control is very important, very, very integral to voice culture, understanding breath control. It also has topics in yoga and other facets of music, not just in singing. And it incorporates um, tips on diet as well, how diet can affect our singing voice and our overall mechanism, vocal mechanism. So it's a much more holistic approach. It's not as singular and as uh, specific as just singing. But through this holistic approach, we can develop a stronger, more mature, more flexible uh, singing voice that can last longer with the proper, utilizing the proper techniques of care and practice. So, why is it important? Why is voice culture important? Voice culture is important because when you understand the structure and the mechanism that produces sound for singing, you are in a better position to one, train your voice more efficiently and more effectively. You reduce the chances of vocal damage through misuse or overexertion, when you understand how your mechanism works, you increase the longevity of your voice. When you train it with care, you will be able to sing for a longer period of time. You will also be able to appreciate the sensitivity and the capability of your voice so that you know how to maintain your voice. And also through voice culture, the holistic approach enables you to really unlock the uniqueness of your own voice. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Of course, every voice is unique, but what these exercises and what these philosophies help each of us do is integrate them into our own self-study, into our own self-practice, and to utilize them to our benefit. <clears throat> and so some some of the benefits, what are the practical benefits now of voice culture? Yes, by just practicing swada patterns or singing in a non-systematized way, through trial and error, we can develop our voice. It is possible we can develop the strength, the agility, et cetera, of our voice. But what voice culture what voice culture provides is a systematized way of improving voice agility and flexibility. It get, you gain breath power and breath control, which is integral. I know I've mentioned this before, but breath power and breath control are integral to voice culture. In addition to that, you are able to expand your vocal range through systematized methods, and then you also improve the tone quality of your voice as well. So those are some of the practical benefits of understanding voice culture. By the way, do let me know if I'm talking too fast. I've been told with my accent, you know, it can be difficult to understand. So yes, if I am, just do let me know, and I can slow down. Okay. 
So now I'll move into what is voice. It's interesting. There are two types of voice. We have one voice, two different types. We have speech voice, and then we have singing voice. So what are the differences between the two? It's very self-explanatory. Speech voice is the voice that we use to speak. Singing voice is the voice that we use to sing. But what's interesting is, when I speak, you hear my voice rise and fall. I'm using specific contours to express my thoughts. But what distinguishes speech voice from singing voice is that when each of us speaks, we speak in what I like to call indefinable pitch. Here I am, talking, my voice is rising, my voice is falling. But can anyone identify a very specific pitch at what I'm talking at? No, correct, because I'm speaking at indefinable pitch. Singing voice, on the other hand, you are projecting sound at a definable pitch. And so inherently, with the singing voice, it's much more complex, much more musically sophisticated than the speech voice, and it requires more effort to train and develop. So those are just some basic differences between the two different types of voices that we use. But as we train our voices through singing, it inherently benefits our, abil our ability to speak, to project, to enunciate, to be clear in what we say. So there are benefits to our speech voice when we practice singing as well. So then I move on to the next topic within voice culture, voice quality. What is voice quality? So voice quality is the combination of two different elements. One, it's the basic fundamental structure of our vocal organ. That is one, what we are born with. Two, it is the, when the vocal mechanism, that fundamental basic structure is refined under very specific training, those two together produce vocal quality. And what another term for voice quality would be voice maturity, essentially. When one's natural voice undergoes systematized training and it reaches its optimal level, that is ideal voice quality. So, now that we talked about what is voice culture, why it's important and its benefits, that, and we talked about voice and voice quality, now I'm going to move on to talking about the physiology within voice culture. Because as I said earlier, as I said earlier, voice culture deals with many different topics because it's a broad, it's a broad field. But for our purposes, given that this is just a two-day workshop, we're going to stick to just the basics. Physiology, breathing exercises, and practice. So, moving on to the physiology, which is very important in voice culture. We start from the bottom up. Where does singing begin? Singing, it's we're utilizing sound, but where does the sound come from? And how can we understand our bodies to optimize the production of sound? So I'm going to briefly outline the anatomy of the vocal and breathing mechanisms that help to create the ideal singing voice, sound production. So we begin from the bottom up. Sound, singing, always from the bottom up. Diaphragm. Diaphragm is essential for all singing because it provides foundational support for a clear and steady stream of breath. Above the diaphragm, we have our lungs. Above our lungs, we have our trachea, which is also called the windpipe. And these three, the diaphragm, the lungs, and the trachea, all these three fall under the lower respiratory system within voice culture. Then, from the trachea, we have what is called the larynx. That's the scientific word, or the voice box. That's where our voice comes from. 
and it lies in the middle of our neck. Men can easily identify their voice box because they have an Adam's apple. Their voice box or their larynx lies around that area. And so for women, it's kind of the same, halfway. Above the larynx, we have the pharynx. That's the scientific term, or called the throat. And the throat serves as a pathway for breath to get our breath from the diaphragm through the lungs out to the general audience. So that is called the pharynx or the throat, and it's divided into three different sections. We have the section right above the larynx, which is called, it's very scientific, but bear with me, the laryngopharynx. Then we have the middle part of the pharynx, which is called the oropharynx, and it lies right behind the mouth, the cavity of the mouth. And then we have the top part of the pharynx, which is called the nasopharynx, because it lies right behind the nasal cavity. And the reason these three are really important is because these provide the three resonating chambers of singing. There are three resonating chambers in the human body, the nose, the mouth, and the throat. And so by understanding the three different layers of the pharynx where the nasopharynx lies, the oropharynx lies, the laryngopharynx lies, when we sing, we can be more intentional about how we direct tone into each of these resonating chambers to create a different vocal quality. So it also enhances our singing performance in that way as well. So why is this important? Why is it important to understand the physiology, the diaphragm, the lungs, trachea, larynx, pharynx? Why are all of these important? They're important because when you understand where singing begins, this is where singing begins. When you understand the physical, you can better appreciate what it produces. When you understand the mechanism that produces sound, and when you understand how air flows into the lungs, into the diaphragm, and back out again, you are in a better position to control your breath and if you can control your breath, you can become a better singer because all singing begins with breath. If there is no breath, there is no singing. So on that note, I would like to move on into some breathing exercises for tonight's workshop because I find that not enough attention is given to breathing. But breathing, especially in voice culture, it is fundamental, fundamental to singing because the steady flow of air, not only does it enable you to sing long musical phrases with continuity, but breath gives you power, breath gives you control, and also utilizing the breath in a very judicious way prevents unnecessary tension from developing in your throat and it allows you to project to a wider audience. It's, it's integral. Breathing is integral. And so tonight, I would like to focus on some breathing exercises, if that's OK. Yeah, OK. So we can begin with some physical relaxation exercises. And some of these exercises you know, are also implemented in voice culture techniques as well. It's, it's like a sport. you know, Singing, it requires effort. It requires specific, intense training. So like any other sport, we have to warm up the physical organ, correct? So we're just going to start with some physical relaxation exercises. There are a couple places where we hold tension when we sing. That is the neck, the jaw, and the shoulders. So just follow me. We're just going to relax the neck. Yeah, sit in a comfortable position and make sure your body is erect, that your posture is straight. And we're just gonna move our neck to the right and the left just to loosen up our neck muscles. So. Mm. 
Now forward and back. Make sure also in all of these that you are breathing. Now we're just going to do a basic shoulder roll. Now other way. Very good. Now, what's also important in singing is the ability to enunciate, enunciate clearly. So we're going to do a tongue exercise. You can do it with your mouth closed, but the idea is to move your, mouth, your tongue in various directions in your mouth just to get the tongue warmed up. So take about 10 seconds you can warm up your tongue. And if you want a very specific pattern to utilize to warm up the tongue, you can recite la 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 la, ye 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 ye, to warm up both the front of the tongue and the back of the tongue. So let's do it. Okay. And now we're going to relax the jaw. So a basic relaxation exercise in voice culture is to just open and close the jaw. Because uh, when we sing, sometimes, especially when we're singing in higher registers, we have the tendency to clench the jaw because we think that by tensing, it's interesting, we think that by tensing we have more control. It's like when you're driving, you hold onto the wheel tighter because you have more control, but I'll never forget what Dr. Taranath, Dr. Th uh, Rajiv Taranath once told me. He said, relax, it's the easiest thing in the world. But I find that relaxing is very difficult, especially when singing, because for me also, the more I relax, the less I feel like I'm in control. So learning how to relax, it's a skill. So with our jaw, Basic open and closing, just like. And also when you do this, what I like to say is be very mindful in your practice. Don't just open and close the jaw, really feel what's happening. And if you do feel tension, be, be mindful of it and release it. So those are some basic, those are some basic physical exercises. We did the neck, we did the shoulders, we did the jaw, and we did the tongue. And some of you may be wondering, you know, this seems very simple, um, very basic, but these are foundational for voice culture as well, because remember, singing, it's first physical before it's anything else. And this is part of the holistic approach that voice culture takes um, in you know, the study of proper voice production. This is part of the physiology component of voice culture. So we're going to move on to breathing exercises. Like I said, tonight we're just gonna focus on breathing. And this is going to be in real time. So I'm not going to go through these exercises quickly to give you a summary. We're all going to do it together so that you get an idea of how it should actually be practiced. And so as we go through these exercises, there are a few things to keep in mind. When you're going through these exercises, be mindful. Be mindful of what's happening in your body. As you breathe in, be aware of what's happening. As you breathe out, be aware of what's happening. Then as you continue, make sure you're practicing carefully, make sure you're practicing consistently, and make sure you're practicing thoroughly. So let's move on to the first basic breathing exercise. We're just going to do a deep inhale, exhale, nothing forced, just relaxed. Just make sure that it's deep inhalations because what we want to achieve with this particular exercise, we want to feel and identify the diaphragm. There are two types of breathing, shallow breathing and deep breathing. And I'll give you a brief demonstration of what is considered shallow breathing or chest breathing. 
It's when you breathe only from your lungs, and you know you're breathing from your lungs only when your chest rises and falls only. Do you see how my chest is rising and falling? Breathing from your diaphragm, or what is called diaphragmatic breathing. Do you see the change in my body? My whole body expands. That's how you know you're breathing from your diaphragm. So we're going to inhale and exhale five times, breathing in deeply into your diaphragm and letting the air out in a relaxed, natural way. So let's begin. Inhale. Exhale. Again. Your stomach should protrude. One more. So again, what this does, if you practice mindful breathing by breathing in this way, you are able to identify and warm up the diaphragm. Has, does anyone have any problems in identifying, being able to breathe deeply? No? Okay. So we can move on to the next exercise. Usually each exercise you perform about five times, but if you want to perform less or more, depending on how much time you have, you can also do that. So now we're going to move on to inhalation. <clears throat> We're going to breathe in deeply, but this time we are going to exhale in a very controlled manner. And again, all of these exercises are designed to refine our breath control because breath control, once again, it's integral to voice culture, integral to singing. So we're, I'll show you what we're going to do. We are just going to inhale and then we are going to exhale in a steady stream like this. So, the purpose of this exercise is to, one, engage the proper muscles so that the breath is controlled. In the first exercise we did, when we just inhaled and exhaled, we just relaxed and allowed the breath to leave. But, when it comes to singing, being able to achieve a steady flow of airstream is integral. So, that's what this exercise is designed to do. And the reason we utilize the shh method, which is also a Western technique, actually, the reason we utilize this method is because with the H, the shh sound, there is the tendency for air to escape through the nasal cavity. So we have to be more intentional about directing the airflow simply through our mouth. So it's good training to prevent air from escaping through our nose and directing it only through our mouth. And the reason we put our finger here is so that we can also feel the steady stream of air. Because singing, it's not just sound in voice culture, it's also through feel as well. So when I have my finger here, I can also gauge whether or not air is escaping through my nose, which isn't helpful, especially when singing. So let's do this exercise about five times. Take your time in between each exercise because what you don't want to happen, you don't want to hyperventilate. When you are doing breathing exercises, you do have to be very careful because if you breathe too rapidly, there is the possibility of fainting or passing out and you don't want that to happen. So we have to be very mindful, very careful when we are practicing these breathing exercises. So let's do it together. We're going to inhale deeply. Remember, inhale into your diaphragm, not just your lungs. Inhale into your diaphragm and then let the air out in a steady stream.
So I was releasing all of my air through my mouth. There is also that tendency, it, it, it does require practice. Sometimes the air naturally escapes through the nose. So then we end up with, you know, and you're not able to sustain a breath for very long. But this, this exercise, when you do it over and over again, good practice to be able to sustain long musical phrases with minimal breaks. So let's do it once again. That was, what, the first time or the second time? We'll do it about three, three more times, okay? So inhale deeply into the diaphragm. Feel the expansion. Exhale. We can take a small break because it's easy to get lightheaded. About five seconds. Just breathe. Okay, again, inhale deeply. Feel the expansion. Exhale. One thing you can also do if you find that air is escaping through your nose, you can also pinch your nose. That's also a possibility, just so that you can feel what it's like to allow the air just to escape through, to direct the air through your mouth. So one more time. Inhale deeply. Very good. So as I said before, this is just one basic exercise to one, help control the steady flow of air, and two, to train, train your muscles to direct the air through your mouth and not your nose. So now we are going to move on to the next exercise within voice culture. It's called slow breathing, but this time we're going to breathe in time. And so what this exercise does, it's very similar to the previous exercise in that it helps us develop the muscles to control a steady flow of air. But within time, we're going to exhale on a five count, then we're going to exhale on a 10 count, then we're going to exhale on a 15 count. And what this does is it increases the stamina of the lungs and the diaphragm for breath support so that you are able to sustain longer passages in musical composition. So what we're going to do, we're going to inhale naturally. We're going to inhale and then we're going to exhale on five counts. And we're going to do that two times. Ready? Inhale. Exhale. Two, three, four, five. Is all the breath out? All the breath should be out by the end of five seconds. Let's do that one more time. Inhale deeply. Exhale. One, two, three, four, five. By the end of these five seconds, all of the breath should be out. Let's move on to 10 seconds. Inhale deeply. Exhale. One, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. No? That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. It requires, um, it requires practice to build up one's stamina. But what this exercise is important for, it also helps you regulate how you release the flow of air within a thal structure. So if you have pain thal, and you're singing a composition, do you want to sustain that phrase for one avartana, half an avartana? So when you breathe, when you train your breathing in time, it also helps you um, regulate your musical phrasing in relation to the, the thal structure as well. So 
We can try 10 seconds one more time. I know it's difficult, but it's all progressive. This is part of voice culture. It's systematized. So begin with five seconds. If you can't jump to 10 seconds, increase to six or seven. So you slowly want to build up your breathing endurance. You also want to expand your lung capacity because that's also very possible as well. Expanding the capacity of the lungs to hold more air. That's certainly possible, and that's what these exercises are designed to do as well. So one more time, we're going to inhale, and then we're gonna exhale. How about on an eight count? We'll do an eight count. So inhale deeply. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so what, I know I keep talking about the benefits of these exercises, what this exercise also does is it also trains you how, and how quickly or how slowly to release the air because the goal is by the end of the time, you want your lungs to be empty. That's the goal. So yeah, there's no shortcut here. Um, you have to be very intentional about how much air you're releasing given the time frame. Within five seconds, you have to release it much more quickly but controlled. It's not just, you have to be very controlled. You have to engage the proper muscles so that you have full control. And then as the time increases, it requires much more stamina, much more endurance, but it's all progressive. Once again, it's systematized. So now, the next exercise we were practicing that by exhaling through our nose, correct? That's one way to allow the air to exit. It's through the nose. Now we're going to practice the same exercise, but we're going to release it through the mouth. So we're going to inhale, but on our exhale, we're going to make a sound. And then again, direct the air through your mouth. Don't allow any air to escape through your nose, which is also a tendency as well. So inhale. Exhale. Very good. And very good. As you get to the end, you should feel your abdominal muscles really engaging because um, <coughs> Towards the end, you shouldn't just release the air in a relaxed manner. Everything should be controlled from the beginning to the end. So let's try that again, this time in time, five seconds. So we're gonna inhale deeply, release on a five count. Release. <laughs> Someone is still exhaling, that's good. So remember when uh, when we're exhaling in time, the goal is to try to release all of the air by the end of the count. So let's try that one more time. Inhale. Exhale. Very good. Now let's move on to eight count. Inhale. Exhale. You guys can actually hold it for 10 counts. I realize, okay, great. Oh, yes, okay, let's do 10 counts this time. So inhale, we're gonna do a 10 count. Inhale. Exhale on 10 count. I think you guys can do 12 counts, actually, but we won't do that today. <laughs> we won't do that today. Um, so does anyone thus far have any questions regarding any of the breathing exercises that we've done? No? No questions? Okay. So now the next exercise, you know, utilized in voice culture as well, we're going to breathe in, hold, and then exhale. So what this does is it strengthens our lungs and it also provides a, meth, uh, a systematized way to expand our lung capacity as well by being able to hold large amounts of air. So one thing that I also want to mention is um, when we breathe in, 
and it might require practice. When you breathe in, try to create the sound. Just listen. What I'm essentially doing when I'm breathing, I'm opening my throat. You know when you go to the dentist and they check the back of your throat? Ah, uh, they say open. Imagine that. But your mouth is closed. Then you inhale with an open throat because what you don't want is because what that does, it, it's not a good sound. It's not a good sound. It's thin, it's weak, but also your throat, it's closed. So over time, if you breathe in that way, you begin to erode the muscles of your throat and you begin to cause unnecessary strain. So what you want to do is you want to open your throat when you breathe so that your throat is in a relaxed position and the airflow is steady and consistent. So try that. Before we move on to the next exercise, open your throat, open the back of the throat, and let's just do about five inhales, exhales. I just want to make sure that you all understand the, the process of proper breathing. So inhale. So I'm making like an ah uh, sound with my throat. I'm dropping the back of my tongue, making an ah uh, sound, ah, uh, but I'm. Now actually try to breathe the incorrect way. Breathe through your throat. <clears> throat> Do you hear and feel the strain? We don't want that. Now breathe correctly once again. Very good. So that's something that you all should implement whenever you're practicing these vocal exercises. So now moving on to the breathe in and hold. We're going to breathe in over four counts. We're going to hold for eight counts, and then we're going to just exhale, OK? Relaxed, OK? So we're going to breathe in on four. Ready? How did that feel? Anyone feel a little lightheaded? No? OK. So what this does, as I've said before, this helps to strengthen the lungs and expand lung capacity. And we're beginning with the inhalation on four counts, exhalation, or holding on eight. But as you continue to progress in these exercises, you can increase the time as well. So let's try that for a few more times. OK, so inhale on four counts. Ready? Once again, inhale on four. Two more times. Remember, when we inhale, inhale into the diaphragm, you should feel your entire body expand. So inhale on four. Last one. Inhale on four. Very, very good. How do people feel? Lightheaded? Fine? OK. So now we're going to move on to our last exercise 
for this evening. And in voice culture, this is called snatch breath. It's a breath that you snatch in between phrases. Sometimes when you're singing a very fast musical passage, you have to snatch a breath very quickly. So there are two different ways to approach this snatch breath technique. And that is to inhale quickly, exhale very slowly. So let's try that. Inhale, almost like you have, you know when you have something in your nose like But instead of doing it from the nose, from the throat, try doing it from the diaphragm. You should feel your stomach protrude. Yep. Very good. So what we'll do, we'll do a few exercises where we snatch an inhalation and then just exhale steadily at your own pace. No time. So inhale. Again, inhale. Three more times. Inhale. Again. One more. Very good. So that's one exercise. There's another exercise in voice culture that's called panting. You know, when um, it's hot outside and you've gone for a run and you're panting. Something similar to that, except you're not panting from the chest or the voice, you're panting from the diaphragm. So it's a very intentional action. I know it's a little funny, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going to, to pant for about 10 times. And what that does, it, it, it makes us comfortable with quick inhalations. So let's just try that about 10 times at your own pace. And again, with this one, just take a listen. There's this kind of inhalation. And then there's this kind. The last one is wrong because you're pulling from your nose and your throat. You don't want that. And it's very shallow. It's not supportive. This one, you're only getting air into your lungs and it also it doesn't sound good. This one, remember, throat open once again. Because remember how I told you about the anatomy? This is why knowing the anatomy is really important as well. Because I know if I'm struggling with this exercise, and because I'm performing this, performing this exercise, like I know how to fix it. By understanding the anatomy, I know to open my throat actually. Oh, open my throat. My diaphragm is down here. So visualizing my diaphragm pulling in the air very quickly. We can all try it. Now try the wrong way. So now you know how both feels. So once again, I said tonight, I want to focus just on the breathing exercises. These are only some of the basic breathing exercises within voice culture. Again, it can, it's a very broad subject, and it can become much more advanced. But for our purposes, we're just going to stick to the basics. When you practice these exercises, remember to always conduct mindful practice so that you're paying attention to what's happening in your body as you're performing these exercises. You're being very thorough. You're being thorough in the practice. You're consistent. You try to do a little bit every day, even if you're not able to perform all of these exercises in your self-study. Try to take about two or three of these exercises before you start your vocal practice. So it's being consistent so that you can develop your breath support, breath control. And then it's also being very careful. Like I said again, between each breathing exercise, take a pause. It's very easy to hyperventilate and to hurt yourself. And I don't want that to happen when you perform these breathing exercises as well. Remember, not a closed throat when you breathe but an open throat as well, because it also protects 
your vocal tract as well, and it doesn't cause erosion and fatigue over time. So it's being very, it's mindful, it's being consistent, thorough, and being very careful in this practice. So these are some of the foundational elements to breathing techniques in voice culture. Tomorrow we will discuss some singing warm-ups as well as some vocal stability exercises. But for tonight, I would like to conclude. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so what open throat essentially means is you create an ah sound. You try, create this sound. Go ah. You drop the back of your tongue. By dropping the back of your tongue, you create an open sound with your voice. I use the analogy of the dentist. When the dentist says, or the doctor says, open wide, you don't want your tongue lifted because when your tongue is lifted, you create a very nasal sound. Ah. Uh, and you're singing from your throat. Ah. Uh, just practice singing with the back of your tongue raised, creating a nasal sound, and then drop the back of your tongue to create an open sound, almost like when you gasp. <gasps> that feeling, that's open throat. So you shouldn't hear any huskiness. The sound shouldn't be thin. It should be deep and mellow. Almost like you're yawning. When you yawn, pay attention the next time you yawn. That's an open throat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does anyone else have any other questions? No? OK. Well, then we'll conclude for tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. We had a wonderful uh, demonstration of various aspects of voice culture. Mm -hmm. We started with uh, physiology, mm -hmm. little bit of anatomy, and breathing exercises. And I have explained the students regarding how to hold the diaphragm, etc. Mm -hmm. It was a wonderful demonstration. Thank you very much. Yeah. We will be looking forward for your practical workshop tomorrow. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you once again. Good evening, everyone. I welcome all of you for the second session of voice culture training workshop. And I welcome on behalf of Swarasankula Sangeeta Sabha, Swarasankula Music School, and Kemp's Center for Learning. We have here this evening as a resource person, Sophia Boss. We had our sessions yesterday, and she had explained about the little bit of anatomy, physiology, and uh, other aspects of vocal training. Some exercises she had taught us. Today it is going to be practical exercise, which she is going to explain and make you do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bhaskar. And I want to say once again, thank you very much to Pandit Veera Bhadraya, uh, Pandit Nirodi, and Dr. Bhaskar for organizing this two-day workshop. And I want to say uh, thank you, a hearty thank you to Kemp's Center for Learning for hosting this workshop. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you. So before I get started, yesterday, for day one of our workshop, I was requested by Vidwan Manasa Nayana to talk a little bit and give mention to the Alexander Technique, which is a very prominent technique in Western cultures, Western classical cultures. And in a conversation that I had with him yesterday, he told me that Alexander technique isn't widely utilized within 
Indian musical circles. So he requested that I just make a brief mention. So, what is the Alexander Technique? According to alexandertechnique.com, the Alexander Technique is a way of learning to move mindfully through life. The Alexander process shines a light on inefficient or bad habits of movement and patterns of accumulated tension, which interferes with our innate ability to move easily and according to how we are designed. The Alexander Technique is a simple yet powerful approach that offers the opportunity for one person to take charge of one's own learning and healing process. It's not just a series of passive treatments, but an active exploration that changes the way one thinks and responds in an activity. Can you hear me now? Still? Okay. The Alexander Technique produces a skill set that can be applied in every situation. Lessons leave one feeling lighter, freer, and more grounded. So what are the benefits of Alexander Technique? According, once again, to alexandertechnique.com, the benefit of Alexander Technique is Excess tension in your body can cause a variety of unpleasant symptoms, and it can interfere with your ability to perform activities well. Performers, singers, dancers, etc., who want to improve the quality of their singing, playing, acting, or dancing have come to the Alexander Technique from, ac from across the globe. The Alexander Technique has been taught for over a century, and people of all ages and lifestyles have used the technique to improve the quality of their lives. So essentially, the Alexander Technique is a universal method that can be applied to any situation regardless of age or lifestyle. So that is my brief mention on the Alexander Technique uh, on behalf of Vidwan Manasa Nayana. Thank you. So, oh. so just to briefly, very briefly, recount what we went over yesterday, I talked a little bit about voice culture, what it is, why it's important, and I also discussed some of its benefits. I talked about the differences in speaking voice and singing voice, which, to review, with our speaking voice, the primary difference between speaking and singing voice is that when we speak, we are not using a controlled stream of breath. I'm not thinking about the pressure and the speed of my airflow when I'm talking. I get a thought, and I just say it. But in singing, what's crucial is the breath stream. The pressure and the speed determine the control that we have over our vocal cords depending on whether we're singing in a low register or a high register. So that's just a brief review of the differences between speech voice and singing voice. Then I briefly outlined the anatomy, the physiology of the respiratory system, which is divided into the lower respiratory system, or the chest voice, and the upper respiratory system, which is also considered to be the head voice. And then we moved into some breathing exercises, which I hope you all found really helpful. Um, according to Dr. Shamala, uh, Vinod, she's an expert. She's an expert in voice culture and voxology. She says that having a healthy respiratory system is key to singing, and we must, we must emphasize and prioritize individualized breathing practice apart from singing. Of course, when we sing, we're utilizing our breath. That's obvious. But how many of us singers, how many of us dedicate separate time 
to just breathing. At least for me, in my singing practice, I haven't. But she says that breathing is mandatory. It is compulsory because we need a healthy respiratory system in order to sing. So today, we are going to move on to some techniques for what is considered in both voxology and voice culture to be the ideal voice production techniques. And this is something that Dr. Shamala Vinod has talked about in one of her discussions, one of her discussions on voice culture and voxology. But before I go into that, I want to mention voice space. What is voice space? This is something that Dr. Vinod also emphasized in one of her discussions. And understanding one's voice space makes us a better and more competent singer. So voice space, according to Dr. Vinod, is that one octave based on one's shruti, that one octave in which the singer's voice can maneuver comfortably. Not just that octave, but a little beyond, a little above, and a little below. That is considered voice space. And this is, very, this is a very important concept in voxology, knowing one's voice space. There are three basic methods to identify one's voice space. And it's a very deep science, according to Dr. Vinod. So she provided us with three basic, but very, uh, very helpful ways for us to identify our voice space. One, voice space is based on our shruti, that one octave plus half above. So we have sa to tarsa, then sarigamapa. That is the upper half of our voice space. And then the mandra saptak, sani dapama. So mapadalisa uh, to tarsa, then saregamapa, that entire range is considered our voice space. If one's voice can maneuver relatively comfortably within that two octave range, then that is one indicator that we are functioning in our correct voice space. Two, the second point to identify one's correct voice space is if you are able to execute ornamentation in both extremes. So that upper half and that <coughs> lower half. If you can execute ornamentation relatively comfortably within those two extremes, then that would be considered your voice space. And then finally, last but certainly not least, breathing. If your breath support is able to sustain the stamina of your voice within that two octave range, then you are functioning within your voice <coughs> space. So those are the three important concepts within voice culture and voxology that all singers should be aware of when, when practicing. Are you functioning within your voice space? So to reiterate, once more, when you're functioning in your voice space, it's one octave, half above, half below. Second, being able to execute ornamentation in the upper half and the lower half, those two extremes. And then third, the breath support. The breath sh support should be strong and it should be consistent throughout uh, that two octave range. So that is her definition of voice space. So today, uh, I know yesterday, we emphasized breathing exercises. Today, we are going to uh, begin with a couple physical relaxation exercises because according to Dr. Shamala Vinod, once again, in order to improve our singing voice, we have to start with where singing begins, and that's the physical. She recommends neck relaxation, jaw relaxation, shoulder relaxation, because she also said that with many of her students, they carry a lot of tension in the shoulders right here. And if we carry tension in our shoulders, inevitably it's going to cause tension in our throat as well. So what she recommends is daily doing shoulder exercises, shoulder rolls, very basic before uh, we start our singing practice. So we're going to begin with a couple physical relaxation exercises. And then I'm going to lead us through some 
singing warm-ups. Singing warm-ups, very basic uh, in voice culture. And then we're going to do some vocal stability exercises. So it comes up to around 10 exercises. These aren't very advanced. They're very basic and can be generally applied to everyone. That's the key. What these exercises provide is just a general foundation for every singer to practice. But the goal is to eventually individualize and customize these exercises and these techniques to suit the needs of each individual voice because every voice is different. So uh, these are some universal uh, techniques. Um, very basic, so about 10. Let me, we'll get started. Let me just um, get my Shruti box open. Dr. Bhaskar, I know you mentioned gentlemen sing at C-sharp, women generally at G-sharp. Is there a general pitch that we would like to practice these exercises on? Or I can also divide it between gentlemen and ladies. I can change the Shruti. Divide it between gentlemen and women, of course. So like I said before, we're going to start with um, these prescribed relaxation methods. So we're just going to warm up our neck muscles by doing a neck roll counterclockwise five times, then clockwise five times. Take your time, you know? The, the point isn't to get through these exercises. The point is to get from these exercises. So really feel the relaxation in your neck. We can get started. Okay, so everyone feeling relaxed, let's now move on to shoulder roll. Five back, five forward. Slow and controlled. Wherever you feel tension, just try to release that. Very good. So now, another exercise that Dr. Vinod prescribes is loosening our jaw. Because the jaw also inhibits our voice from reaching higher registers when it's tense. That's interesting, isn't it? Who would have thought that tension in our jaw can affect our ability to sing high notes? That's why grounding singing first in the physical is so important. So basic jaw exercise, take about 10 open closes with your mouth. Good. Now we're going to move on to a singing warm-up 
that is very common in Western singing. It's called the yawn sigh. Have any of you heard of it? The yawn sigh? <laughs> it's where we intentionally yawn. Because I want to tell you something. On the roof of our mouth, we have the hard palate and the soft palate. If you take your tongue and touch the roof of your mouth, that's your hard palate. Move your tongue to the back. Do you feel something soft and squishy? That is your soft palate. And your soft palate is key, <clears throat> is key to being able to access your head voice. You've all heard of that chest voice versus head voice, right? Singing in the head voice is very difficult for singers. When we want to sing in a higher register, that soft palate needs to lift. That is integral. One, it enables us to access the higher register without strain, but it also prevents, it also cures the nasal sound. When our soft palate is low, we have a nasal sound and we don't want to sing with a nasal sound. So what this yawn sigh technique, yes, exactly. <laughs> what this yawn sigh technique does, when we yawn, we're lifting our soft palate. And so we try to, through this exercise, we want to practice intentionally yawning because then it acquaints us with what it feels like to lift our soft palate. So what we're gonna try to do, it's difficult for some people to yawn, you know, intentionally, but begin just by opening the throat and inhaling deeply with your mouth closed. And then sigh. Do it about five times. Remember, like I said, the point is to get through these quickly. The point is to get from it. So work at it until you achieve some kind of yawn or some kind of lift. So we can go ahead and do that. And then sigh. Really, remember what I said yesterday. When we practice, one of the keys is to be mindful. Try to actually feel that soft palate lift. And what you can actually do, yes, you end up actually on. <laughs> what you can actually do to get used to producing sound in your head voice, we on. Let's do that actually. Did you kind of feel it up here? You kind of felt it in your head. Are you young? <laughs> we can do it one more time. So the goal, I know it's kind of funny, isn't it? It's a little funny. But the goal of this exercise is while that palate is open, we can practice sending sound. Send sound to our head while that soft palate is lifted because then it gives us practice feeling what resonance is like. Yes, exactly. No, what's interesting is we try to intentionally yawn, but when you're sleepy tonight, as you're going to bed, when you yawn, pay attention to what's happening in your body. I'll, I'll, you can just do that. If you can't, if you can't yawn on cue, that's okay. When you're going to bed tonight, when you yawn, just be mindful of what's happening to your soft palate and let out a 
Yes, exactly. Very good. So that was the yawn side technique. Now we're going to move on to abdominal breathing. Don't worry, we're going to get to the voice stability. But Dr. Shamala Binod said this particular exercise is compulsory within voxology before we sing. What we're going to do is we're just going to do five abdominal breaths. And once again, what that means for people who weren't here yesterday is you inhale deeply, filling your lungs, filling your diaphragm, and exhaling in a controlled and steady manner, not just releasing the breath. Controlled and steady until all the breath is out. And one thing Dr. Vinod also said is this must be habituated. We must get into the habit of abdominal breathing for the purposes of singing using abdominal breath. So we're gonna just do five. Inhale deeply. Remember your stomach should protrude. Inhale. And while you're doing this, remember just to keep the throat open. You don't want to... Because that wear and tear will eventually erode the sheen of your voice. Because as we all know, I'm sure most of us know, with age, our the elasticity in our vocal cords, it diminishes. So our vo voice actually becomes more brittle when we're older. So we want to practice safe, healthy methods of breathing now so that we can increase the longevity of our voice. So imagine, even though our lips are closed and we're exhaling through our nose, imagine that you're making an ah uh, sound with your throat. Because that allows the throat to be open to provide a clear pathway for the air to leave. So, what do we have? We have three more, three more to do. So inhale, throw it open. And really feel, really feel the expanse of the abdomen. And when you exhale, feel the abdominal muscles engage. Two more. Last one. Very, very good. So now we're going to move on to another warm up. This is called the tongue trill. Has anyone heard of the tongue trill? Yes, you have. <laughs> I also made a mention of Alexander Technique at the beginning of his workshop, for your sake, yes. Um, the tongue trill helps in enunciation or articulation because, yes, even though we can just practice ah uh, sounds coming from our voice, singing is also speaking, it's melodious speaking. So within voice culture and voxology, enunciation is also key. So the tongue trill, it's fairly simple. Not many people can do it, but for those who can't do it, I have a modified version for you all. So the tongue trill is essentially this. Very good. For those, if it's difficult for you to do a tongue trill, just practice these, these sounds. <laughs> 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 
da 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 yeah let's do it da 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 very good now hard d da 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 La 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 la. Now la 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 la. Very good. So what you'll notice with these exercises is that each one targets the front part of our mouth, the between our teeth, and then in the middle of our mouth. So we have the da 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 la la. So it's not always necessary for you to be able to do a. It's fine as long as you practice slowly. Da 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 da. These simple exercises, it's just warming up the tongue and getting the tongue used to pronouncing different consonants. So that is the tongue drill. So now we move on to an exercise. Oh, before I move on, not only does the tongue drill help in enunciation and articulation, but it also aids in loosening the jaw as well. Because we can't have a tight jaw. See, I can't do it with a tight jaw. My jaw has to be relaxed in order to produce the sound. Very good. And when we're doing this, the key is not to force the jaw down. The jaw should just be in a relaxed position. Very, very good. So that is the last point that I want to make about the tongue trill. So now we move on to a very, very, very famous exercise, especially in Western vocal singing, which helps to expand vocal range. It helps to expand our vocal range, get us comfortable transitioning from the chest voice to the head voice without putting any unnecessary strain on our throat. Many singers use this around the world. The lip trill, it's it's you know considered one of the singer's favorites. So before I go into this, the chest voice and the head voice. For me as a singer, it has been very uncomfortable for me getting used to singing in my head voice because it's here that I feel like I lack more stability. My throat and my chest, I obviously feel like I have more control. What this lip trill does is not only does it allow us to access our head voice, but it makes us comfortable with how we leave our chest register and how we enter our head, then how we leave our head and how we enter our chest. Because what we want to, cre to create as singers when we're singing in different registers, is we want to create continuity as we're singing from our lower register, our chest voice, to our high register, our head voice, we don't want any breaks in between. So instead of just, um, instead of just singing from the bottom of our range to the top of our range on ah, uh, which puts strain on our voice, singers use the lip trill. And how it goes is like this. Take two fingers, put them on either side on the soft parts of your cheek. And then softly blow air through. Can you do it a little up? Like right here. Jaw. Jaw shouldn't be tight. The 
it's not going to work. I know it looks funny, but what's interesting is it's the funny exercises that are actually effective. So, right here because you want your lips to be able to move. It's like you're mimicking a horse. off of our vocal cords when we go from our chest to our head. So the goal, this is the exercise. want to 
pay attention to here, what we want to pay attention to here, it's not just creating the sound of a siren. Ah, it's not just that. Pay attention to what is happening when your chin, when the pitch rises, the resonance is moving from your chest to your head. And for most singers, it's around this area when we transition from the chest to the head that we have that vocal break. Our voice breaks. And there is no continuity in the sound as we go from our chest to our head. So do it slowly and pay attention to how through the lip trill, if you're doing it properly with the right breath support, using your abdominal muscles, you actually will not have a break. There will be no break because of how this exercise is designed. And this is why it's so famous. So let's try it a few more times. But this time, like I said, mindful practice, pay attention to that in-between, that transition where you're moving from your chest to your head. Remember, abdominal breathing, a lot of breath support, and don't force anything. Just your voice will know where to go. When you have the right breath support and you have the right, um, when your throat is in the right position, your body knows where to send your voice. So let's try it once again. The goal is to expand our range. So really try to hit that upper part of your range without straining. Keep your throat open and relaxed. That's number one. And then second is pay attention to that in between, that transition from the chest to the head. <laughs> from the chest to the head it should be smooth or are people encountering some difficulties? Are there still some breaks? No? Fairly comfortable with all this? Yes. Okay, so going back to your question, Sunita, regarding how to expand your range, this is a safe method because your shruti is A, correct? Yes. Your shruti is A, so you're having trouble feeling relaxed in the upper half, correct? In the thug sata. Yes. This will really help. And it's a safe method because it takes the strain off the vocal cords. So as you get comfortable with this, then you can transition to doing akka, doing glides. So I would recommend this exercise for you. You're welcome. So now we're going to move on to vocal stability exercises. There is a saying, well, I came up with the saying, it's not a saying. If you can stand, you can walk, correct? Yes, if you can walk, you can run. So, with, with the musical material that we have currently within Indian classical music, the, the, the voice patterns, the akka, the swara patterns, that really helps us with our agility, our flexibility, and our range. But within a uh, voice culture and voxology, what we want to do simply at this point is just stand on a note. We're just going to stand. Because when you stand, you improve the tone and the clarity, the maturity of the note. And it aids in developing your breath control. So we want to just really appreciate and enhance the beauty of each note at a time. We're not going to be focusing on fancy patterns. We're just going to be focusing on the note, the spot up. So we are in G. So I'll begin with the ladies, and then I'll change the shruti to around C sharp for the gentlemen. We're going to hum. Humming is similar to the lip trill in that when we hum, we take the strain off of our vocal cords, okay? So remember, all of these practices, these are safe habits to develop. And what I find is, I like saying, Om. I like using Om because it tells my throat, it tells my mouth how it should be shaped. I'm creating an awe 
I'm going on, but I'm closing my lips. Remember, it's all, we're always going to be in the all position. So what humming, as you all know, as I've said before, humming, it takes the tension off of our throat, but what it also does, it gets us used to feeling resonance in our head, okay? When we hum, we feel the resonance. Uh, we feel that in our throat, our chest area. Uh, Back to the mindful practice. Feel, feel your cheeks. They should be vibrating. You should feel the resonance in your head. So gentlemen, if you can sing along, whatever notes you can sing, feel free. But what we're going to do is we're going to go up the octave, just mantra sapta. That's it. We're gonna stand on each note, humming, and then we're gonna ascend, and then we're gonna descend, okay? So is this fine, G? Is G okay for you ladies? Is that okay? So we're gonna start with soft, but humming. the resonance in your head, but also pay attention to how your voice is wavering. When you stand, it's like in yoga, when you balance on one foot, your muscles, they're adjusting. Because what we're essentially doing, this is yoga. We're essentially balancing on one note. So pay attention to how your voice is maneuvering and correct it, because that the goal is to the goal is to create as seamless a sound as possible.
resonance should be brought forward. You should feel like it's in your face, not in the back of your head. My head is vibrating a lot. Let's just go up to pa, and then we're going to come back down. Gentlemen, how is this for you? Is this okay? So we'll just go sa to pa, pa, back to sa. So, pa. <laughs> Because I find that it's much more difficult to stand on a note than it is to run across notes. You know, I used to play piano when I was much younger, and I used to prefer to play the passages very quickly because it hides my mistakes. But when I have to slow down and play the composition, I realize I didn't know it. It's interesting how with our subconscious, we can play, I'll speak for myself, I can play a composition very fast, but when I have to slow it down, do I really understand the composition if I cannot play it slow? No. So this is also a good exercise in learning how to be patient with your voice. Because you, you can't you can't fake the process. You can't just you can't run before you walk. You can't walk before you stand. So, it seems very time consuming and it's easy to get impatient, but this is where it begins. If there's no foundation, the house can't stand. The house can't stand. So we need to go back to the basics. Just remember, just learn how to stand. That's it, your voice and your music will thank you in the future. If you give it the due time, if you give it the, the patience that it needs to cultivate and to nurture, beginning with learning how to stand on notes. So, we did that and we're coming. Now, we are going to move on to Akka, which uh, Dr. Shamara Binod said, should be practiced every single day. And we do it all the time when we're practicing our swada patterns. But with this, these exercises, I just want you to know, all of them are going to be very slow, primarily focused on standing on the note. But how do we stand? Standing in different ways. This first exercise, we hummed on the note. And by the way, when you were humming, you shouldn't have felt any strain on your vocal cords because the sound was resonating in your head. Your head was functioning as the resonating chamber for the voice, not the throat. So if you did feel some type of strain in the humming, 
visualization is really important. Imagine you have just a hollow cavity in your head and you send the sound up there and then let it resonate. So, visualization in voice culture is very important. And before I forget, even when we're standing on a note, what I sometimes imagine is I imagine that there's a target in front of me. You'll see me doing a lot of hand gestures. I'll be doing this, I'll be doing this. It's because I see the target. That target in my mind is the note. And for me, I'm trying to, to hit that target as precisely as I can. So it, um, visualization, singing is also very mental. And that's something that voice culture talks about as well. The power of imagery, the power of visualization. So figure out what works for you. When you're standing on the note, think about that target. When you're trying to send your voice into your head, when you're humming, imagine that you're sending it up like an elevator into this hollow cavity of your head. And in that way, you'll be able to sing more effectively and more safely. So now, we're going to move on to another standing exercise. Yes, this is within voxology as well. We're going to stand using Akkad. So we're going to do Saregamapa Pamagaresa. Since we're in the Kyoji. So remember, in this, we want abdominal breathing. Abdominal breathing, our throat should be open, our posture should be relaxed, and inhale using your diaphragm, and then with a steady stream of air, sing ah on sa, but don't over exhaust the air. For example, you don't want to end the ah with ah, because that's going to cause damage to your throat. It'll eventually erode the sheen of your vocal cords. So when you find there should be there should be a point when you're exhaling that you engage your abdominal muscles because you want to use the power from the diaphragm, the abdominal muscles that engage the diaphragm to bring the breath out. But there comes a point in the tail end of the exhalation where it can be a little fried. We don't want that. So when you feel that coming on, yeah, exactly. When you feel that coming on, just stop the breath. Like, uh, just stop. That's fine. So we're going to inhale. We're going to do this about five times, okay? We're going to do this about five times. Because remember, and I'll repeat it again, it's getting from it, not getting through it. Patience.
with my voice as a singer. I always gauged my progress on my ability to run through notes. It's the speed and the agility. But when I discovered the importance of standing, it's a really good lesson. Because when you stand on a note, you don't feel like you're making any progress. I'll speak for myself. I'm like, ah, oh, what's the point of this? Ah, oh, no. But whenever, we stand on a note, you are perfecting that note. You are getting closer and closer with each exercise to achieving purity, clarity, and maturity on that note, aligning your voice with that note as closely as possible. And what is so beautiful about music is that it's an infinite process. You can always get infinitely more aligned with that note, but it's our goal as artists, as singers, is to get as close as we can in this lifetime to achieving the, the essence of that note because it's on the note that music is built. Don't neglect the note. Don't just focus on the phrase. Don't just focus on the pattern. Go back to the note because if you can perfect the note, then the rest of your singing will take care of itself. So this is progress. I just want you to know. This is progress in your singing. Don't be discouraged, don't get impatient. I'll reiterate the points. When you stand on the note, don't let it waver. Try to create as steady a stream as possible. And the way to achieve that unification with the note, it's the breath. Now you know why I emphasize breathing techniques only yesterday, because it's all with the breath. The ability, the breath is like the muscle. So in yoga, when we're standing, trying to find balance, our muscles are shaking because we're trying to find alignment. We're trying to, to steady our body. The breath, consider the breath as the muscle for singing. Without the muscle, you can't move. Without the breath, you can't sing. So what we're exercising here is the muscle. We're exercising the breath. So for the sake of time, we're going to, um, we did akar five times on sa. We'll do akar on uh, Rega Mapa just two times each for the sake of time. But, ah, never mind, I'll talk about that afterwards. So, Re. Oh.
Very, very good. So now, in the next exercise that we're going to do, we are going to do Saregamapa, Pamagaresa, but now we're going to use Saregamapa, Pamagaresa. And what you'll notice is these exercises, they, they build off of one another. We begin with the humming, a closed mouth position. Then we just open it. Now we're getting to the enunciation. It's important to practice enunciation. So now, for the sake of time, we're just going to sustain on each note but once. Okay. And also remember, are we being mindful of abdominal breathing? Remember, that's something that we need to habituate. So, abdominal breathing. Very good, and you can actually sustain it for as long as you're comfortable. Just because some people stop, you can continue. Today. once again to enunciation, saying Saregamapa, Pamagaresa. So, in the Saregamapa, 
One thing to remember is that when we are saying re, it's not re. We always, in all of these exercises, want to maintain an open throat. Ah. So even when we're singing re, it's rounded. It's not re. It's re. So keep your throat open. Always try to achieve the ah gun, the ah, with, yes, with a loose jaw. Okay, so for the sake of time, we don't have to go through, actually, this is the last one, but I will talk through it because it will actually take a long time. All of these exercises, we did it on ah, but within voxology, Vowel scales are really important. Practicing all of these standing exercises using the different vowels. And it varies according to language. That makes sense. But some of them are a, e, i, o, u. And the reason why practicing these standing exercises on different vowels is because the shape requires different kinds of breath support. So it's like cross-training in a sport. You're cross-training your voice so that it gets used to uh, controlling different quantities of air uh, to produce the desired vowel effect. So just keep that in mind. When uh, you go home and when you practice, you practice with Akka, but practice with different vowels because it will benefit. It will benefit your singing in the long run. To conclude, so to conclude, I would really encourage you all to take separate time away from your singing to practice breathing techniques. It's obvious, of course, we breathe when we're singing, but how many of us actually dedicate quality time to just breathing because when we're singing we're actually integrating many things we have to be aware of our breathing we have to be aware of our physiology okay is my throat open okay is my throat open so the physiology where is my breath is my breath coming from my abdomen where is the where is the voice resonating like in the humming exercise is the voice resonating in my throat if it is that's incorrect it should be resonating in my head. So we have to be aware of the physiology. We have to be aware of the respiratory system. We have to be aware of the resonating chambers. And then we have to be aware of the sound itself. How is the enunciation coming of the Saregamapa or the words that we're singing? So when you think about it, singing is not just one thing. It's the integration of many different elements. And what voice culture seeks to do is to separate those elements so that we give due focus to each element so that when we strengthen each one, when we integrate them in singing, when they come together in singing, it can only benefit our singing. So I would encourage you all, as part of your practice, just try to dedicate a few minutes each day to Adana breathing. It can be part of your yogic practices, pranayama, just deep inhalations, just get used to your physiology. Pay attention to where the breath is coming out. When you sing, before, before you start any lesson, just practice standing on a few notes. It doesn't have to be a, a full two octave range, like we did tonight. That's it, 10, 15 minutes, because your, your voice will get stronger, you will develop better tone quality, your, your lungs and your respiratory system will be healthy and you, you become more just conscious of the entire mechanism that helps us to produce the voice, to sing. And so we also increase the longevity of the voice. But with these exercises, what we have to do, when we stand on these notes, these slow patterns, we have to fall in love once again with the note. Okay, because that's what sing, all singing, all music is based on. It's, it's based on the one note. It's like nature. 
Everything is made up of that atom. That atom is microscopic and it might be insignificant, but without the atom, we don't have all this. Without the note, we don't have music. So fall in love with the note again. It'll thank you. Your music will thank you. Your voice will thank you. So that's all I have for tonight. I want to thank you all for inviting me to this two-day workshop. It's been a pleasure. All the best in your musical journeys. Thank you. questions when you sing we hear there are two different types of sound there's how we sound in our own head and then there's how we sound to an audience so there's how we sound inside and then how we actually sound outside I actually think that a voice monitor that's perfectly fine because then you can you have a visual uh, you can yes. visually gauge yeah, extent, how close yeah. you are to the note yeah absolutely yeah. fine and I can see how unstable I am especially with the lower notes. that's actually good <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a good practice to have because remember, with voice culture, it's also a process of visualizing. So being able to not I just, you're not hearing your sound, you're seeing your pitch. You're seeing your sound. That's very helpful. In it's a free app, Vocal Pitch Monitor. What's it called? Vocal Pitch Monitor. There's several out there, but this is the one I use and it's very good. Okay, so what? Vocal what's Pitch Monitor app, it's free. Good, the Vocal Pitch Monitor app helps to gauge one's pitch when they're singing. So yeah. Yeah. That's good. The other question I have is uh, um, acid reflux, mm -hmm. in the, especially in the throat, mm -hmm. silent reflux, where you get... <coughs> mm -hmm. um, do you have any hacks for it? Do you yeah. have? Is that addressed at all? Yeah, so in voice culture, digestion plays a big role Ooh, in yeah. uh, one's singing health. Um, and it varies from person to person. Uh, generally speaking, People say to avoid spicy food, carbonated drinks, uh, junk food, um, because junk food, it takes a long time to digest. And when your stomach is overactive, that's what creates the acid reflux. And when we feel it here, that's actually um, eroding the throat. So over time, it's actually not healthy to the longevity. So stick to things that are organic. Drink lots of water, actually. In uh, voice culture, they recommend at least 250 milliliters in the morning. But throughout the day, you should be drinking and hydrating yourself every single day. 3.7 liters for men, 2.7 liters of water for women, generally speaking, every single day. But then again, it varies from person to person. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you should add this straw phonation. Yes, yeah. the straw. You mean breathing through the straw? Yeah, think singing to the through the, through the straw. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, that's fairly helpful in reducing the vocal strain. That's very good. So what he's saying is adding the straw technique. And the reason I didn't incorporate the straw technique is we don't have straws. So at home, you can. It's like the the inhalation. Remember yesterday when we did the inhalation, but we exhaled on. The straw technique, that's essentially the straw technique without the straw. But with the straw technique, it's very self-explanatory. You breathe out through the straw, taking care not to breathe through the nose, and that also helps with relieving tension from the throat and also developing greater breath control. So yeah, thank you. Any other questions? So those uh, exercises. Hmm? A-E-I-O-U. Uh-huh. I-E. So you can just take one vowel at a time. And then as you get comfortable, you can go up and up the octave and then even trying to reach in your higher register. Um, you can also, instead of going stepwise, because I come from a Western classical tradition, so instead of the ah, uh, it's ah, uh, very stepwise. You can also glide. You can glide up and down the octave as well. And for you, when you want to increase your range, going from sa to tar sa in one glide and then back down, then go from sa to tar re then back down until you reach ma. That's where you're feeling strained. So try that glide, but don't force it. 
whatever is comfortable for you. So, are, are you clear with the AEIO? Yeah. Okay, good. I, I used to do um, one OL for one not. Oh, uh, okay. So, at first I used to sustain mm -hmm. uh, each note. Mm -hmm. And then I used to sing in one breath to start to pop. Mm -hmm. And then from back part to start. Yeah, you can also do that as well. Yeah. You can also do that as well. Remember, these, these are just basic generalized techniques, but I, I'm glad you mentioned this. The, the goal is to eventually get to a point to where these exercises are individualized for the purpose of self-study. So whatever works for you, I'm glad that you already have a method. Yeah, for doing this. So that's good. You're welcome. Any other questions? In the middle of the practice sessions, I was feeling a bit too, like open, strained, like something. Uh -huh. So generally speaking, there are two, how do I describe this? So it shouldn't feel burning. You shouldn't feel any type of burning in your throat. If you do feel any kind of vocal strain, just take a break and relax. As you're practicing these, it is normal to feel a little bit of fatigue. It's normal, it's like any other sport. You will feel a little bit of fatigue, but don't push past that, okay? That's why, you know what they say, singing and developing, cultivating your voice, it doesn't happen overnight. Because it's like stretching also. I can eventually get into a deeper stretch, but it'll take time. I'll feel a little bit of tension, a little bit of pain, but like stretching, you don't want to push beyond that. But the next day, try to go a little further and then back off. Because it's all about consistency, a little bit of progress each day. So. It's going to take a lot of time. It'll require a lot of patience, I know. But your voice will thank you in the future. So any kind of strain, just take a break. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Being a college professor, we're talking the entire day. Uh-huh. So that I feel always gives a lot of fatigue. Uh-huh. Uh, people, people say that it might damage the voice. Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, technique you would suggest that uh, while talking mm -hmm. we should maintain or focus mm -hmm. which will keep our, uh, uh, what to say, I mean, yeah. uh, which will not allow us to be um, all over throat to have such effect. To increase the longevity of your voice. Yes. Do you know actually within voice culture this is also applicable to orators and people who speak, professors like yourself. So these exercises actually will help in becoming a better speaker. When you speak and you're projecting, when you project, just be mindful of how you're projecting. Don't shout, don't overexert, but when you speak, speak from your abdomen. You know, it goes back to the breath. When you speak, use your abdominal muscles, and when you project, allow, the mic, allow when you are speaking, your throat to be open. Allow your throat to be open, stay relaxed, don't be tense. When you're speaking, don't force anything. It shouldn't be breathy, but having a strong respiratory system, these breathing exercises that you'll see in the first video, as well as these, uh, these standing on note exercises, it'll actually help you become a better speaker as well. So that is directly talked about in voice culture. These aren't just for singers. These are for actors. These are for orators like yourself. So just continue with this and just speak mindfully. You know, you can project without straining. Just know that. Projecting doesn't mean overexerting. Yeah, Thank you. you're welcome. I have a similar kind of question. Mm -hmm. but also, after laughing, we feel so much. Our, our voice is so strained. And uh -huh. Is there some technique to laugh in a way that uh, does it <laughs> strain our voice much? <laughs> because I laugh a lot in college daily, but it gives me a lot of strain. To yeah. My voice. You know what it is. You know what I say. Laughing. Well, I don't say this. It's a famous saying. Laughing is good medicine. Enjoy life. Laughing is good. Okay. Yeah, but I don't want to strain my voice so much that it's very strained and dried out and feeling like Do you that. know what my technique is? After you laugh, don't sing. Okay? After you laugh, just rest. Because laughing is normal. How do you not laugh? Actually, it'll be more strain on your voice to stifle a laugh. Let it out naturally. And then here's just a technique that I came up off the top of my head right now because this actually, this is the first question, you know, that I've heard regarding, you know, techniques for correct laughing. Yeah. When you laugh, 
Some people, they laugh with a tight throat. When you laugh, be open. You know like the belly laughing? Ha, 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 ha. You can practice your akar in that way. Ha, 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 ha. Like that. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I would say. Don't, don't have a tight throat when you laugh. Closed throat. Just be more mindful when you open. But laugh. Enjoy life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. I've, yes. I've read in some books. Uh -huh. Smile and start singing. Uh -huh. The throat is supposed to open and relax and voice comes over. Mm -hmm. That is that true? That is true. Actually. Okay. In, um, yeah, because you know what smiling does? Smiling actually takes the tension off of your jaw. Physiologically, see, this is why understanding the physiology is important. With the exercises, okay, why do we soften our neck? Why do we relax our jaw? We can also smile. Practice smiling when you're singing. Natural smiling because it naturally loosens the jaw. That's actually um, scientifically proven. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you all so much. Best of luck. Sure, all of you will agree that we had a wonderful session and uh, you all enjoyed and we learned a lot and uh, I hope that all of you will practice whatever she has told us. And once again, I thank on behalf of Swarasankula Sangeeta Sabha, Swarasankula Music School and also Camp Center for Learning for having come here and conducted this workshop. Thank you so much. As a token of gratitude and respect, I would like to give you a small memento. Uh, it's my Guruji's Pandit Nirodi's project, Samarpan. Thank you so much. Thank you.